Hi, everyone. My name is Paul Sulelis, and I'm here from Providence, Rhode Island, where I uh, teach at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and for the last three weeks, I've had the real pleasure of being an artist in residence here at the Internet Archive. So thank you, Brewster and Wendy and everybody here for making this a very, very special experience. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project of mine, queer archive work, and how it intersected with the public domain here during my time at the Internet Archive. Um, we tend to think about archives, I think, like this. This isn't an actual archive, this is an artwork. Uh, but places of deep abundance, um, rich sites that house a multitude of perspectives. This can certainly be true, um, but archives are also sites of erasure, allowing some voices to be amplified while others are minimized or excluded when they don't fit into normative narratives. Traditionally, stories involving people of color, queer people, and other historically marginalized voices have been left out of archives or diminished because of ignorance or homophobia or racism. Histories aren't discovered in archives. Rather, we use archives to actively construct versions of history, stories that accommodate our own subjectivities and ideologies. All too frequently, these stories favor the familiar structures of oppression, whiteness, patriarchy, and capitalism. Likewise, um, the public domain is a remarkable construction that allows us to define who is or isn't included in these normative narratives. The public domain proclaims certain intellectual property as owned by no one. Cultural material in the public domain theoretically belongs to everyone. As copyright law enables new content to enter the public domain each year, it's important to look closely at which voices are amplified in the celebration of open culture. There is no actual public domain. There is no site or territory or designation that reflects an authentic condition of making public. Rather, as we've been hearing all day, it's a legal status created by those who control access. The institutions that define the public domain, museums, libraries, courts, archives like this one, give or deny access to these materials that have been designated as open and available. But as an institutional construct, the public domain can easily fail to reflect any true nature of the public. Without careful consideration, access to the public domain ends up repeating and perpetuating in a highly predictable way those same oppressive structures that govern society and culture. So what can be done? It's crucial that we carefully examine our archives and search for lost voices, stories of failure, nonlinear trajectories, and other non-conventional perspectives. We must refuse to accept traditional timelines at face value and work to amplify marginalized material that has otherwise gone unnoticed or even erased. When confronting an archive or any presentation of historic content, I think it's irresponsible not to ask urgent questions like, what is this material's relation to power? Who has been excluded? Who else should be included here in order to better understand the cultural context? Once engaged, we can actively work to change the shape of history, giving it dimension and depth and greater representation for all who were involved. This is what I call queer archive work. I'm really grateful to the Internet Archive for inviting me to help shape their effort to present newly available material in the public domain. During my residency here for the last three weeks, I've been searching archive.org, 
in particular for evidence of African American culture, Native American culture, very early LGBTQ voices, and other artifacts, all from 1923, that in the past would have been forgotten or actively left out of celebrations like this one today. If something seemed to be missing, I tried to find it elsewhere and add it to archive.org. Many of the items that you've been seeing up here were uploaded by me in the last two weeks. Remarkably, I found the very first open, openly lesbian book of poetry ever published. Uh, that was in 1923 by the Bay Area poet Elsa Gidlow. It's titled On a Gray Thread. It's a very rare book, and it had never been digitized, but I was able to find the author's original copy of the book here in her papers in San Francisco in the GOBT Historical Society archives. They put me in touch with the author's estate, and they sent a PDF for me to upload. So the entire book is now online as of a few days ago. <laughs> The result of my time here is this publication, which includes all of the artifacts you've just been seeing up here with Wikipedia descriptions and a text by me. Um, I'm really proud that the Internet Archive helped me to produce this. Queer Archive work issue number two, two, 1923 Internet Archive edition is being distributed here today. I think many of you already have a copy. It's an edition of 100 copies that I edited, designed, and printed myself um, at a small press in Berkeley. All of the items I found are now available on archive.org. If you grab a copy of the zine, all the URLs are in there. By bringing these almost forgotten artifacts together in the form of a publication, my hope is to create a place for voices and positions to co-mingle. It's a collection made possible by the Internet Archive, and by printing it, I'm slowing the material down for you to get a closer look. I think by doing more of this work, we can challenge what we think or assume we know about the early years of the 20th century and imagine other kinds of histories. In our current political climate, where our relationship to information and truth is precarious, to say the least, I see this work as a form of resistance. It's barely a scratch in the surface of history, but it makes a difference, and we need to do much, much more. Thank you.